Okay, so first I want to go through a live deployment of this overall solution working in action. So notice that I have a very simple implementation of ASP.NET Web API. If I come over here and I type help, I've implemented a get for sample data. And you can see using the help page what the sample data looks like. It just returns an array of objects that has a property name with a value. And so if I come up here and I type API slash sample data, notice that I get a basic authentication dialog. So I'll type my user and password here. And then notice if I open this, I get a JSON result. And as I mentioned in the blog post, this is a very compressed and efficient format. So the communication between CRM Online and Windows Azure will be as fast as possible. All right, so I'll close this out. Now I'm going to come over to actual CRM Online. I'm going to create a new account. All right, I'm going to call this test and just click save. So what you notice here is that we have the description updated. And that's because we had a CRM.NET plugin that made a call out to the Windows Azure hosted ASP.NET Web API based REST service. In the plugin, I took the results coming back from the REST service and just concatenated them in updated description. And so this is really that end-to-end -end experience. We've got a .NET sandbox plugin running in CRM Online. It's calling out to a REST based service running in Windows Azure. We're using the trusted subsystem model, passing a username and password over basic authentication. And what you may not realize is that this is actually the GUID for the CRM user so that if we needed to, in the code running in Windows Azure, we could actually call back into CRM using impersonation. So let's take a look at all this in action. All right, so I have a few parts here. I have the CRM pieces of the solution. I have the Azure pieces of the solution and have a little helper console application to, to make things easier to demonstrate. So first, let's take a look at our MVC web role. So again, in my blog post, I mentioned that the prerequisites to understanding this video are going through some of the ASP.NET Web API walkthroughs. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time explaining ASP.NET Web API. However, we'll took a, take a look at this controller. Notice it inherits from API controller. And in my case, I'm just hard coding some in-memory data because I really just want to focus on getting the end-to-end -end scenario working, not the meat of the, the logic behind the web service. You'll notice that I have the authorize attribute on the get all sample data method. I have a bunch of explanation here, but basically what this says is that, you know, I'm really just showing you the plumbing of getting the web API wired up. Um, from this point, you can do things like call into backend systems behind your firewall using Windows Azure networking, do things like using impersonation, and here I, I show you a little example of how to extract the CRM caller ID using a custom HTTP header, and then if I wanted to, you could then pass that off to the CRM organization service to, to force impersonation. But ultimately, this service just re returns that data, and if the CRM caller ID is passed in, I go ahead and add that to the collection of data, sample data that's returned. So the key to getting basic authentication to work really is implementing this basic auth HTTP module. And this class, for the most part, is a copy and paste of the code from the ASP.NET Web API walkthrough on basic authentication. The only thing I've really done is instead of hard coding the username and password, I actually get them out of Azure configuration settings. So if you're familiar with Azure, I just call get configuration setting value. And those configuration setting values configured right over here and of course I also say if you want to build out a more elaborate username and password lookup scheme go for it right because it's just code here and obviously you might want to think about encrypting the username and password but in our case this is a trusted subsystem model so having a single username and password that the plugin uses to call into Windows Azure is not a big deal because ultimately we're going to use impersonation if we want that Windows Azure code to execute under the context of that CRM user. And last but not least, in the web config, in the modules section under system.webserver, I've added 
my basic auth HTTP module, which is this class right here. So that's all you need to do to get the basic authentication working for the service. So what about the client? Well, let's start with my console application first. Notice here I've implemented this class called my HTTP client wrapper. And this class is just a wrapper around the HTTP client class that's part of Web API for client programming. And again, there's a walkthrough on how to use this class in my blog post. But basically, what you notice here is I'm basically setting it up. I'm adding my custom caller ID HTTP header. And I'm just following the same patterns from the walkthrough. So basically, we provided a base address. We pass over our username and password. In this case, as a tester, I'm just hard coding a GUID that will be passed over and then we call get sample data. So let's just debug all this. So I'll uh, start this up in the Azure Compute Emulator. Alright, so we've got this running in the Azure Compute Emulator. I'm going to come back to Visual Studio over here and I'm going to debug my console application. Okay, so we're in the client. So this is similar to what, what the plugin code is going to look like. I'm going to hit an F5. Now we're actually in the service running in the Azure Compute Emulator. And so this is going through that authenticate user code that's coming from the basic auth HTTP module. And ultimately, this is going to call check password. If I step in there, it's going to look up the password from Azure Config. If it matches, it lets you in. So let's see that in action one more time. I'm going to debug console application. And this time I'm going to go back over to my controller here. And I'm going to set a breakpoint right here as well. So we're in the client. Now we're running in the code hosted right now in the Windows Azure Compute Emulator. If I get that caller ID out, we just add it to the collection. If you look at the collection, it's got four items and we return it. I'm going to come back over here, the client, and another breakpoint, just hit F5. So now we're back on the client, we got our sample data back and we write it to the console. Alright, so we've proven everything works. Now let's get this working in a CRM plugin. So I'll stop here. And I'll just jump up to my plugin project. And I've already created a plugin. I created this using the CRM Developer Toolkit. So you're going to need to download the latest version of the CRM SDK and install the CRM Developer Toolkit add-in. There's a version for Visual Studio 2010 and there's a version for Visual Studio 2012. I'm obviously using the version for Visual Studio 2012. But if you look at the code, it's relatively similar. Except in this case, I'm actually pointing to Windows Azure. Notice that right now I'm using HTTP instead of HTTPS. Now obviously in a production environment, you're, all, you're going to want to call this over SSL so that the username and password aren't sent over in clear text. So of course you want to make sure you use SSL in production. All right? And the reason that I didn't use SSL in this example is that Serum Online will not allow an HTTPS endpoint which uses a self-signed cert. So I would have had to go out and purchase a certificate from a certificate authority. So that'll be an exercise for your production environment. But once you put this under HTTPS, the username and password are protected. We're using that trusted subsystem model. Here we're getting the user ID, the, the GUID that represents this user. So we're preparing all this so we can pass it off to Windows Azure so it can, so it can implement impersonation. And again, if we look at my client wrapper here, it adds that as a custom HTTP header. We call get sample data. We just use a, a string builder to build a string off of that sample data. Then we get the entity for this plugin. I call two entities so I can use early bound types. And then ultimately we just set the description of the account equal to that string concatenation that we did earlier. And of course the way plugins work is that that strip description gets populated and then gets persisted to the database. So I definitely encourage you to download the code 
once you understand the web API, you basically understand that what we did is we created an API controller that returns some data. In this case, it was just doctored up data, but obviously you could call another external system, a local SQLizer database, you name it, right? A database behind your firewall using Windows Azure networking, call back into CRM using impersonation. You kind of get the idea here. We protected it with the authorize attribute. We implemented an HTTP module for basic authentication. We then configured that HTTP module in the web config. And then client side, I skipped over this, but hopefully you figured this out if you walked through the web API walkthroughs, right? I had to add the web API client libraries here. Once I've done that, it's just a matter of using those client libraries. I create a little helper class to make it easier. And then from my plugin, I use those client libraries to pass the username and password, the caller ID, and then call the REST service. Use the results of the REST service in my plugin, and that's the end-to-end -end sample. So the one thing you might have noticed is that if I come back over here to NuGet packages, I added IL merge. Well, why is that? Because these are three libraries that the plugin is now dependent on. If you understand how CRM plugins in the sandbox work, you can't deploy those to CRM online. So you have to use a, an approach that, that most CRM developers use, which is to use this utility called IL merge to take these three libraries and merge them into a single library. So let's just take a look at how that works. Let's come over to properties here. I have a post build step. And I'm just going to walk you through this at a high level. Again, you'll want to download the code and, and review this. But basically, what we're doing is telling I'll merge to create a new DLL, target the .NET Framework 4.0. We're going to start with the DLL, which is the plugin DLL. Then we're going to merge into this new DLL, that DLL, plus the three DLLs we got from NuGet. And of course, we have to sign the resulting DLL with our strong name key file. And then ultimately we're just going to copy that merge DLL over the original DLL and the merge PDB file over the original PDB file. And the end result is that this DLL is the combination of our plugin DLL and these four other DLLs all merged into one so that then the CRM developer toolkit will deploy that single DLL to CRM online or to CRM on-prem as a, a sandboxed plugin. And so then if you right click this and say deploy, which I won't do because I've already got it deployed, that'll deploy to CRM. And then again, that'll give us this behavior right here where we can come in, create another test, save it. It's going to save it to the server. The plugin's going to fire. It's going to call the Windows Azure hosted service using basic authentication, again, in production over HTTPS. And then boom, there are the values that came back from the REST service that we called that was hosted in Azure, just to kind of prove that the call was successful. 